Hi, and welcome. Today is one of my most favorite uh, lectures and topics to discuss simply because it's one of the most crucial foundational um, ideas for linguistic anthropology. Anthropology really is how do we become the beings we are and how how do our reactions and our actions and our conversations and our discussions with others shape our worldviews? And today, that's really the, the crux of everything, is we're going to pay very close attention to the interactional construction of perception and what that can reveal, which is really important and probably the most important element to learning how to see as a linguistic anthropologist. And the person, the theorist we're going to focus on, his name is Charles Goodwin. He was a pioneer in exploring the underlying processes of how we come to see as members of a profession. He was a, he's a, distinct, was a distinguished professor at UCLA and he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and this article that I'm going to be discussing through, you know, with all of you was the most downloaded in American anthropology. So many have read it, many are part of it. For those of you who would like to become anthropologists, this is very much the article that can kind of show you one avenue, one lens into how anthropologists study communities communities of speech and talking and all of that and what it does for our our worldviews and our building that worldview. His main point there in that article was that all vision is perspectival and lodged within endogenous communities of practice. What that's saying is that we learn to see it from a community perspective. It's not just all in our minds about who we are. No. For example, an archaeologist and a farmer will see very different phenomenon in the quote unquote like same patch of dirt. So, you know, if you're looking at soil, that, you know, one might see that the soil will support a particular type of crop, you know, um, versus the stains or the features or the artifacts that will provide evidence for, you know, early earlier human activity at this spot. So they're looking at the same patch of dirt or land, but they're understanding and noticing different things about that land very differently because of their different trainings and their different backgrounds and their points and their interests. And so therefore an event being seen as a relevant object of knowledge emerges through the interplay between a domain of scrutiny, in this case that patch of dirt, the images or the images made available in the Rodney King um, videotape of his beating, you know, whatever it is, whatever the domain of interest is, different people looking at that will see and pick up on different things. And it's really, it's a set of discursive practices that are being deployed within a specific activity. And it's not just to do with archaeology or, you know, farming, or in this case with the, the article of, of the discussion today in, in the courtroom, you can see with other things. This is a music sheet. Now, I don't read music. Um, I can recognize that those are notes on a page and that a musician would be able to see that and see the corresponding uh, note to a sound and they don't, they'd be able to understand that. But for me, it's just, you know, gobbledygook. I don't know how to deal with it, you know? So I, I can't read that. If my, I can learn, I could learn, I could take that time and, you know, really train myself and, and go seek out a teacher who would be able to help me learn how to read music. But for me at this moment, those are just signs and I don't know how to interpret them. You can see that also here with the organs in this, you know, in the body that is highlighting and pointing out what is of interest inside the human body, different organs. Maybe a medical student would be looking at this diagram, someone in IP bio looking at that diagram, trying to figure out what the different organs are doing and it's showing that. So this is, these are the socialization routines and learning how to read, learning how to see. Uh, learning how to hear in the case of the musician and how to point out where the symbol on the page refers to for the sound that you're then supposed to be able to produce either with your voice or an inch another instrument. In archaeology, the example that Goodwin himself used in that article, he points out the Munsell chart, which is what archaeologists use to work with with for interpreting um, color and texture in dirt. So they're looking at the color consistency and the texture of the soil and you know a student might take a patch or a piece of dirt and look at it and sort of compare that with the color on the Munsell chart and be able to code it specifically. So students, no matter what field, music, medicine, 
linguistic anthropology, linguistics, students have to learn how to categorize whatever they're seeing, whatever they're hearing, whatever they're feeling, the textures in this case of the archaeologists. And this all requires physical, cognitive, and perceptual work, as well as a number of tools that will aid them in their tasks, in this case, the Munsell chart. And the chart and the forms that they then fill out, these students, they provide this system of classification, which Goodwin calls a coding scheme. So coding is the first of three mechanisms by which our perception, our perception is shaped and reshaped. Coding, highlighting, and graphic representations. These are the three things that Charles Goodwin delineates and explores in that article. And it's really important actually because, for example, when thinking about how to become a linguistic anthropologist, one of the first things that I said was, you're swimming in data, you're living and breathing every day, you're alive and you're in the world, there's so much information out there. And when you take different courses and classes as students in linguistic anthropology and anthropology and biology, whatever you're doing, you're learning a bunch of ways to code and recode your world to understand and see things differently, just like those archaeologist students with the Munsell you know, chart and the dirt, how, le learning how to look at it. Like, I I don't know anything. You can already tell by the way I'm talking about it. Like, I have no idea how to, how to see something differently as something else when I'm looking at a landscape. I don't know, right? It's not my training. My training is to do that with language. So when we see that, we have a systematic practice to transform the world into categories and events that are relevant to the profession. Basically creating an object of knowledge so that when we can as a profession talk to each other know how to how to work with each other how to understand when I say this I'm referring to that right this is an icon and this is referring to this type of sign so these are the things that we've reviewed already at this point in our course and you can see that here coding with the Munsell color chart coding the particular types of colors and texture and so that when archaeologists are you know, talking to each other, not only verbally, but writing these scientific articles, they, they all understand what they're referring to and that there's a system of practice here that's already embedded in the community. And it also marks you as a professional in that space, the fact that you're able to engage in that conversation alone, right? But coding by itself isn't really sufficient for talking about professional vision, especially in the sense that Goodwin was discussing it. The second one was highlighting. Making specific phenomena in a complex perceptual field salient by marking them in some fashion. Highlighting is exactly what it, the title is. It's highlighting, right? You have a highlighter, you can think of it like that way, and you're marking certain things to like make it noticeable to you in future what was the most important aspect of whatever it is you wanted to kind of grab your attention first, right? So through highlighting certain features in the material environment, they're made prominent and then they, they come to shape not only uh, one's own perception, but also that of others. So this is the article of professional vision, the first page of it. Maybe if you printed it out or you downloaded it and you're reading it on some sort of like, you know, PDF reader, you might highlight things, you might, you know, circle something in red, might underline something in green, whatever it, you're doing, those are all different highlighting functions so that whatever is the most salient to you while you're reading, it'll pop out to you. So that's pretty straightforward in this sense, right, for reading. But what about here? You have a picture of a man in the wild, in the nature, landscape somewhere, and you'll see here in this picture that he has little flags, little orange flags and pink flags. He also has a notebook with, if you kind of zoom in, you'll see he has a pink marker. All right, now, if I, it was me looking at that landscape, I'm not gonna really see anything of interest on that ground. I'm just gonna see some grass, some dirt, some rocks, and that's it. But this man with his professional vision, because he's been trained as an archeologist, he's seeing things that are very different there, very different to him. Now, I told the story earlier about how my husband, his work, he's also a linguistic anthropologist, that he works with hunters and gatherers in Eastern Paraguay. And, and the story of me, you know, being on a trek with the families that he was working with. And, you know, I got, you know, a few of us, a little, two kids and me, we got lost on our, uh, with the group, we got lost from the group. Well, really, I learned later, I'm the one who got lost in the group. The other two, the little kids, there was a five-year-old, and I think it was a six-year-old, I really can't remember, but Benjamin was five years old, and he was in there, and was, we're in this really thick brush, and I couldn't see a thing. For me, everything was just forest. I, I didn't, I couldn't interpret anything as to which direction the group might have gone. Uh, I, I was just lost, confused, and scared, right? I had concluded that this is how I die. They, you know, I was in charge of these, these other kids, and now here we are. This is, this is the end of our lives, right? But Benjamin, five-year-old Benjamin, 
he had already figured out by that time at five years old he had been through these socialization routines going through the forest trekking through the forest he was a very good tracker by the age of five already certainly surpassed me and in that environment he was the professional he was an expert i had no expert eyes no expert training at all to understand which way to go in the thick of the forest where there's no path nothing delineated for me i couldn't see where to go whereas for benjamin he looked at that lamp that that environment like the landscape of this archaeologist for example and he had a professional vision he already knew how to orient himself to that space so he just looks around sees probably some broken twigs knows how to interpret the you know the bent of the leaf brand I don't, I don't know i'm making it up right and he just picks a direction the other kid follows him and i'm just like okay well i'm not gonna stay here so i go with benjamin and the other child and then we find the group within a, within like a minute less than and then there we are. So it was a really good teaching moment in terms of in that environment, I'm not the competent one. I'm not the professional. They are, those two kids were mostly, they were in charge of me, not me in charge of them. No way. Another way to think about like how these, how perception is shaped is to think of this. No doubt you've probably come across the Rubens base image. Now here you have this figure ground reversal. For sure you're seeing at least two things, either two faces looking at each other or you're seeing a face. All right now human cognitive activity characteristically occurs in environments that provide a complicated perceptual field. I mean there's so much to encounter if you go to a new city, a new place, there's just so much going on you have to figure out really quick like what are the things to really focus on. So there's this quite general class of uh, cognitive practices that consists of methods used to divide a domain of scrutiny into a figure and ground so that events relevant to the activity of the moment stand out. With thinking about coding and highlighting here where you have forms and other documents and other information, you know, other kinds of information um, that are, you know, have a major textual component of many work environments, right? And when you have such a dense perceptual field, workers in many settings will have to highlight their documents with colored markers or handwritten annotations or stick on notes. And in so doing, they tailor that document so that those parts of it, which contain information relevant to the work at hand are made salient. And it's the same thing when you're traveling to a new place and you figure out and you have your map and you put dots as to where you're going. If you have that physical map, if you really want to have that sort of embedded, you know, text, you know, physical interaction with your environment, not just only use GPS. Although on your GPS on your phone, you can also pin drop things so that you can see exactly where you're going You can do all those things. So we're very used to having a, a very dense perceptual field and then highlighting certain features in certain spaces with different types of items to make sure that we're only grabbing what we really need to because otherwise there's just too much to take in at any given moment. All right, psychologists have for a long time talked about this as the figure ground relation as the basic element of human perception. The third element that Charles Goodwin discussed was graphic representations. He defines it as producing and articulating material representations. In other words, it's the cognitive artifact for the organization and the persuasive display of relevant knowledge. So another way to think about that would be if you're that archaeologist and you've got all of that dirt out there in the world, right, and you want to dis you want to discuss that with someone else who is not physically there with you, the whole part of science making is making relevant to others what is perceivable to you. And so one way to do that would be in the case of the archaeologist is to make a map. It's the it's the careful production product rather of an interaction in the field. Now you also have to explain this map but here is the dirt and it's being explained the image that that map is made from is from this which is itself already the trowel making a line in the dirt is already highlighting something of import in that dense perceptual field that highlighting that 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 the trowel is doing there so you can see something and then the graph representation could even be that image which has an arrow and then the label of the line drawn with trowel or the surface so it's already pointing out things to you and then you have that map that that takes away all the other stuff and really points to you exactly what you need to take away from that let's look at an interaction of how this would be you know, socialize between an expert and a novice.
So here's a transcript, which is already, we'll look at the video of this, but already I want you to notice that this transcript here is of course also a graphic representation of, of talk, right? Here we are doing whatever we're doing and we're talking and have, how do you want to represent that to somebody who's not present there in the moment? You can make a transcript of it. All right, so I'm gonna explain a little bit about this. Everything that is displayed in these maps or these graphic representations, like a transcript, has, has explanation um, attached to it. So there's two participants, Anne and Sue. Anne is the teacher, the professor here, and Sue is the student. She's learning, the novice, she's learning how to see as an archeologist. And there are 17 lines to this transcript, and so I'm gonna read it through before we watch the video. Anne says to Sue, give me the ground surface over here to about 90. Slight pause. No, 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 not, not at 90, from you to about 90. Sue registers it, oh. And then she sees this, there's this teaching moment with Anne. Wherever there's a change in slope, Sue registers, mm -hmm, okay. See, so if it's fairly flat, I'll need one where it stops being fairly flat. Sue chimes in immediately, okay. Like right there. Then I'll need one there, then I'll need one there. Sue, all right. And then one at the, and the transcript ends. This doesn't look particularly interesting or fascinating or super, right? Nothing amazing happening here. It's a normal interaction. But to a discourse analyst, it is really fascinating. It's that, that way that you're, you're seeing how Anne is socializing Sue to pay attention to what needs to be looked at. And what if, you, if she wants to be a successful archaeologist, these are the things she's going to have to pay attention to. These are the things she's going to have to know. She needs to know how to do it. She needs to recognize, make the that dense perceptual field of all of this input that is going on in that field site, be able to point to, like, see, there's a change in slope. And when it's fairly flat, I'll need one when it stops being fairly flat so that Sue can recognize, oh, okay, that's the point of interest. Okay, that's the point of interest. And this is something that happens with all across multiple fields. I'm not an expert in archaeology, but I do these types of things with language and then socializing novices, people who are interested in learning how to look at that dense perceptual field of interaction and sort of see what is interesting to that in that particular frame in that field. What do I need to pay attention to? There's all this stuff going on. Like what's the most important thing for me to know in order for me to move forward in my quest for expertise in this particular topic or field? Hmm? So let's watch the video of this interaction. Just um, give me the ground surface over here to about 90. No, no, not at 90, from you to about 90, mm. wherever there's a change in slope. Okay. So you're mapping the line. See, so if it's there. fairly flat, I'll need one where it stops being fairly flat, okay. like right there. Then I'll need one there, then I'll need one there, and All then right. one at, no. at 40. Okay. So Sue is learning. She's learning how to see. And for that professor, I mean, she doesn't even have to look. She knows everything that's going on. She's taking those that time, as a teacher would, to point out for the student what they're supposed to see for themselves. So she just says, it right there, and there, and there. And she, for her, it's easy. She could probably fill out that form without anything. But of course, you have this teacher-student interaction. And so we can see how knowledge is being embedded inside of an interaction, how sight is being, she's being, taught how to see, essentially. Now, what happens, I mean, if I've just told you that every profession has this, and that we're all learning how to see, specifically according, whatever whatever is interesting in our specific field, we're learning how to see things, and that actually uh, seeing the same thing doesn't really exist because we're all coming at it from different vantage points. If that's the case, then we're probably at some point gonna get contested vision. When we're looking at the quote unquote same thing, but it's not going to be because we have different codes, we highlight things differently, we have different ways of representing the so-called same thing. So how do we how do we deal with that? What do we what what happens when we have different people coming at the same problem? You might have economists at the table, you might have archaeologists at the table, an anthropologist at the table, sociologists at the table, you might have a lawyer at the table. Whoever's at that table, they're gonna be seeing that problem, but very differently. All right, so this whole part about contested vision and how different groups might be looking at it comes into play for Charles Goodwin when he's looking at uh, the Rodney King beating and the trial that happened for the four officers who were then later acquitted. 